Good morning. How's everybody doing on this beautiful day? Amazing. Well, my name is um, Kimberly McQuarrie, and I'm the director of community programming and the co-director of the Innovation Labs here at the Delhi Museum. I want to thank you for joining us um, for this very special edition of our Coffee with the Curator series. Today, we are um, honored to be joined by Dr. Ruth Ann Atchley, who's a professor and researcher at USF who's working at the intersection of psychology and neuroscience. Fortunately for us, um, dreams are among her interests, and she'll be sharing a talk on harnessing dreams, an obsession not only of Dali's, but also an interest of many of the other artists um, featured in our new exhibit, um, The Shape of Dreams. How many people have been upstairs to the, yeah, absolutely. If you haven't, don't miss it. Um, it's pretty amazing. But of course, before um, we get to the talk, we really need to thank um, the sponsors and people who make programs like this possible for all of us. So first, of course, we'd like to thank the city of St. Petersburg for their continued sponsorship, and especially um, our beloved members, because without our members, we are not able to present such programs, and we really depend on you. Now, if this is um, your first visit to one of our programs here at the Delhi Museum, um, I'd like to just share a few of the other things that we have on tap for December. You can always visit our website at thedelhi.org. Um, to check out events um, such as these. So we have the Dali Dozen, which is a showcase of um, local artists um, who are going to be um, exhibiting down here on the 7th, which is today. Um, no, tomorrow, sorry. Um, Thursday, I'm like, what? Thursday. Yeah, that, but Thursday, I think, I think it says the 7th, but it, it's actually Thursday, so it's the 8th. That's just, um, and then, our store is having a holiday show, and um, Dr. Ashley was also um, an advisor for our fashion design students, and they are going to be showcasing their designs at a runway show at Gibbs High School. So that's pretty amazing. Um, there are young designers who, from conception through implementation, create and showcase designs, this time based on the theme of Shape of Dreams, like the exhibit. And if music is more your speed, be sure to come um, back on the 22nd, and we're going to be joined by Oriya, who's going to be presenting a selection of holiday music um, with an uh, instrumentalist from Colombia, and um, the singer is actually from Spain, and luckily for us, actually from Catalonia. Um, so that will be really exciting. And then um, we will be coming back at the beginning of January, first Wednesdays as usual, with a talk by our executive director, Hank Hine, who's gonna be talking about this exhibit, which um, was his baby. Um, and like I said, check out the website. We're gonna have all kinds of fun events. We're gonna have food tasting and mixology events based on ingredients that are supposed to inspire certain kinds of dreams. We're gonna be having dream journaling workshops, um, dream collage workshops, um, and all kinds of other fun activities. But today, we're not here for those um, activities. We're here to actually, hopefully, learn something. And so um, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest speaker. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Ruth Ann Ashley. Um, Dr. Ashley's training and research expertise are in the areas of cognitive and clinical psychology and neuroscience. Her overall research goals are to combine event-related potential electrophysiological data with a range of cognitive psychology tools to examine individual differences in linguistic and emotional processes. For example, with funding from the National Science Foundation grant, she has investigated how problems of language comprehension persist in readers with a history of developmental and acquired language disorders. Related projects seek to develop new measures of the perceptual and neurological processing abilities of older adults and adults with early Alzheimer's by assessing language abilities and tasks that require perceptual processing, neurological processing, and offline grammatical knowledge. She has also spent the last 20 plus years investigating how neurolinguistic processes contribute to the negative cognitive bias seen in depressed individuals and those with chronic pain disorders. This work, funded by the NIMH, examines behavioral and electrophysiological markers that might help to predict depression vulnerability and relapse. Most recently, Dr. Ashley has 
extended this investigation of emotion and language to study more pro-social behaviors, such as work on generosity that's funded by the Templeton Foundation, and looking at how creativity and empathy can be enhanced by spending time in natural environments, work funded by the National Academies of Science. Today, Dr. Atchley is going to kick off a series of Coffee with the Curator lectures focused on elucidating different aspects of the new exhibit, Shape of Dreams, by giving us a look at the scientific basis of being able to harness our dreams. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Atchley. All right, howdy everybody. Good morning. That always makes me a little nervous listening to my own introduction. It's like, have I sort of built myself up too much? But um, I'm, I'm thrilled. I was just saying um, before this, I think this is absolutely the coolest place I've ever given a talk. And I've given talks around the world. But this is a huge honor. I am um, an enormous fan of Dali, of um, surrealist art. Um, to me, if it's a little beautiful and a little disturbing, it's the perfect piece of art. So I think Dali is perfect for me. Um, and um, it also gives me a chance to talk a little bit about sort of what's been a passion of mine in the last 10 or 15 years, which is really looking at sort of issues of what makes humans fun, interesting, excited, happy, and have sort of a psychological well-being that is sustainable across our lifespan. And so I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, work that's, most of this is not my own, but um, it gives us a chance to look, um, peek at some of the cognitive neuroscience research and clinical neuroscience research that's been done around sleep and dreaming. And so I'm going to start with Dali, because that's why we're all here. And it's when I was asked to sort of think about the shape of dreams and this exhibit, a number of Dali quotes really kind of popped out at, at, to me and reflected a really sophisticated, nobody here is probably surprised, but sophisticated understanding of the nature of sleep, sleep, sleep and dreaming, okay? And so I'm going to touch on many of these topics, but I want to start with this idea that's sort of highlighted in the top quote from um, the Diary of Genius, which says, reality dies in dreams. And there really is a sense that um, dreams are a special place where our day-to-day -day perceptual, experiential reality is able to really change and transform. And when you think about the fact that we spend many hours every day in this dream state, we really are blessed, if you will, to experience a, lo a rather long period of time each and every day in this special world that is our dreaming experience, OK? And so I want to talk today about how, as artists, as creative people, just as people who are interested in pursuing a state of more well, greater well-being, we can really potentially harness that time during our dreams in a way that's actually therapeutic, beneficial, helpful. Okay, and so that's really where I'm going with this talk at the very end. So, but again, I just want to sort of pay homage to all of the great conversation that Dolly introduced around this idea of the, po the power of dreams. OK? Now, but I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've got you all in front of me. So we're going to do a little, uh, as I often say to my undergrads, we're going to eat a few Brussels sprouts before we get to dessert. <laughs> So, um, and actually, I love Brussels sprouts now, but when I was a kid, they were my least favorite food, so I used that. Because one of the things I want to do is, and kind of, again, borrowing from um, this quote from Shakespeare, um, I want to give you a little bit of a moment to sort of really stop and appreciate the significance of sleep. OK, so in my work in depression, in my work in fibromyalgia, in my work looking at early um, onset, uh, the early stages of dementia, in all of the clinical populations that I've studied, um, we know that 
Um, sleep is probably one of the most beneficial things we can do for ourselves. And there is this really just, to me, bizarre aspect to current culture that somehow says that our time in sleep is not all that valuable. I've had so many times where that cliche is shared with me from my freshmen, my grad students, others who say, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And I always say, yeah, you'll be dead. <laughs> no worries, because if you're not sleeping enough, it will kill you. It will kill you in lots and lots of ways. So here's this moment of sort of, let's be, let, let me be a little bit harsh and mean, because the ideal amount of sleep for every single person in this room is right around eight hours. And in fact, I noticed some slightly younger members of my audience, for you, your ideal amount of sleep is closer to nine or 10. All right? And you're not getting it. Can I just say, I can say that almost for everybody in this space. But this is really, really, really bad for you, okay? And the ways it's bad for you are subtle, difficult to detect in some ways, and we don't generally associate these medical and psychological issues with a lack of sleep. But there is tons of empirical evidence to show that we can see a four times increase in um, strokes with people who have poor sleep. We know exactly what the mechanism is where sleep changes and makes you at greater risk for things like hypertension and heart disease. Diabetes, it messes with the adrenaline, adrenal system, it messes with many of the mechanisms that allow you to effectively digest food and so forth. So we know that it directly leads to things like diabetes. I can go on and on and on. One of the um, sort of most telling variables here or findings here that I want you to recognize is if you're getting five hours of sleep, it is the same thing as driving drunk every time you get behind the wheel as far as your increased risk for a crash, okay? So this is real. Please, if you take nothing else away from this talk, this is the thing I actually most want you to remember, and that is that you really need to um, prioritize your sleep time and spend time, energy, effort to increase your sleep, everyone in this room. And I know that it is a, one of the most common psychological issues that we deal with, which is a disruption in sleep for various reasons, and insomnia and other kinds of sleep disorders. So really, please, you do not want to put off sleep until you're dead, because you'll be there more quickly, OK? So I'm going to, but I don't love to just sort of raise a concern and go boogity man and then run away and leave you hanging. So let me tell you how you can make sleep more effective. The number one thing you can do is turn off your cell phones. The, what, the blue light, and I know many of you are aware of this, but we still engage in these poor behaviors. Engagement with various kinds of devices, whether they're phones or TV sets or even to some degree Kindle books, those kinds of things. That produces a light signal that is picked up by a receptor in your eye that directly talks to various structures in your brain, and I'm not going to get into what they all are. You can come take my sleep and dreaming class. You'll understand it better. But it directly signals your brain, and you stop producing important neurotransmitters like melatonin, which help with sleep onset. So the number one thing that most of us can do is Turn off our phones a half hour before bed. You want to fall asleep. You really need that much time for the brain to reset and recognize that it's no longer broad daylight, and in fact, it's night, and you should be sleeping. There's a number of other things you can do. If you're interested, I would recommend spend some time, do some research around this concept of sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene practices can include things that are really relatively easy, like changing some of the conditions in your room. In your room. Avoid um, exercise right before bed. Watch caffeine consumption just before bed. You probably already know what it is that's getting away in the way of your good sleep. 
but you need to make it a priority to create a space and a time around your sleep onset, your, your bedtime, that's at least about a half hour. One of my favorites is take a hot bath. There's actually good empirical research that if you come out of a hot bath and then get into bed, that decline in body temperature actually helps stimulate some of these brain structures that tell you that it's time for sleep onset, and particularly entering into the first stages of N1 sleep. Okay, so having a decline in body temperature is a really very pleasant way of inducing sleep. It works. This is not just an old wives' tale. It is, there's plenty of empirical research that shows that it's effective. Okay, so sleep is a way of not dying, to change Dolly's quote. And I really, really want you to pay attention to this because it's a huge health issue in our current culture. Now, enough about all that. Okay, what you really came to hear about. You wanna know about dreams and, and I wanna know about dreams and it's a fascinating area to, to study as a neuroscientist. But I'm gonna say as a disclaimer at the beginning of this, um, and, I, and I do research myself in sleep, um, and I teach courses in sleep and dreaming at the college level. There's a, not an overabundance of sleep and dreaming research. A lot of the, the empirical work that I'm gonna be talking about today is coming to you from, say, a small handful of studies, one, two, four, six, something like that. And um, the, um, so, you know, as an empirical scientist, if I, you know, I, I am myself still skeptical of these findings until we've had a chance to replicate across lots of labs. So that's my disclaimer because I had a panic attack last night that there might be a neuroscientist in the audience. So I don't want to overstate how much evidence and data we have in this area. But there is some interesting stuff and I want to share it with you. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, I'm a neuropsychologist. When I study sleep, I use evidence and information coming from your body from a number of what we call channels or parts of your body. So um, as discussed in my introduction, my primary tool of choice is electroencephalography. So that is where we are measuring actually the electrical activity generated in the brain, primarily by um, a layer of cells in the cortex called the pyramidal cells that are really important for a whole range of different kinds of cognitive and emotional processes. But it's also necessary, interestingly enough, when we are studying sleep using neuroscience methods, that we also have to look at the eyes and we have to look at muscle tone. And I'm gonna get into a little bit about why we have to look at all of those different ways of looking at um, activity in the body and in the brain. But those are the three channels that at least I mostly focus on if I'm doing sleep lab research. If you need to go to a sleep lab and do polysomnographic work, so you get measured and you get all hooked up and you go to bed, these are the channels that are gonna be the most important for understanding your sleep pattern. Now, I'm gonna focus mostly on the electrophysiological data that's coming from the brain. And this is actually ongoing, what we call EEG, or electroencephalographic data. So this is, we put electrodes on people's scalps, and we literally are measuring the sort of tonic or overall level of brain activity across the whole, in effect, cortex, okay? And so this is a good measure for looking at sort of what is the general state of brain activity of a person at any particular millisecond of time, okay? And so at the top, we have a typical kind of EEG or electroencephalographic data that comes in while you're wide awake and alert, okay? So right now, hopefully, you're, none of you are falling asleep. You're finding what I'm saying interesting. And so your EEG, if we were able to put a... a few electrodes on your scalp, and one of my GTA, or my GRAs are here, so she could go do this for you. She's an elect, electrophysiologist. She can make this happen for us. Um, we would look at, we would see activity looks like this. It's dominated by relatively low amplitude or low sized um, electro, electrical signals, but it's also very jagged and quickly changing. We refer to this as beta activity, in case I fl slip and call it that later. But here are what our, here's what our brain looks like uh, typically across the other stages of sleep. 
So in sleep research, we are now using a kind of naming pattern where we talk about in one, that is the kind of sleep that happens just as you're falling asleep. Then we enter a phase we call in two. This is if you use a kind of um, actigraph, which, you know, something like a Fitbit. This is what they call light sleep, typically. And then you get into in three. In the old days, we used to call this stage three and four, if you're familiar with any of this work. We now call it in three. And this is what we typically think of as deep sleep or slow wave sleep is another term we use for this. And then there's our favorite one, REM, at the very bottom. And so what I want you to do is sort of looking across these, I want to ask you a question. When does brain electrical activity look most like the brain activity when we're awake? REM, REM. yeah. Is there another one that's close? N1. N1. Good job, class. I wish my freshmen were this responsive. Also, they don't laugh at my jokes as frequently, so thank you. So anyways, yes, N1 and REM are the two phases of sleep that mo look most like wakefulness. And why this looks, these look like this is because it is dominated by this kind of beta activity, okay? So this relatively low amplitude but high frequency kind of electrical activity across the brain. And that brain activity is something that we generally care, we sort of associate with in cognitive engagement, um, thinking, feeling, um, remembering, in, sensory processing, all of that kind of stuff that our brain is doing as we sit here right now in this highly stimulating environment, okay? But that electrical activity that is driving that beta-dominated um, brainwave pattern is actually fairly different during dreams. Now, how do we know this? It's hard. Let me just stop, start by saying it's hard. It's not like um, we can just ask a person while they're experiencing a dream without disrupting the dream because they're asleep, right? And so the issue that we have is that we have to try to gain access to what dreams look like. So, for example, the sort of gold standard way we do this research is we bring a person into a sleep lab, we hook them all up, and then once they've spent a, a certain amount of time in one of those sleep phases, like REM, we do wake them up and say, what was going on in your head at that point in time? When we measure dream content that way, using data from people in sleep labs and knowing exactly what's going on in the brain when we ask this question, we know that everybody dreams. Now, how many people in this room think they don't dream? Nobody's going to say this. Yeah, a few. You do. Yay, that's good to know. But probably there are a very rare number of um, sort of experiences and, and, and um, situations that can actually lead to a cessation of dreaming. But for most people who raise their hand at that time, you're dreaming, you're just having no recollection of that dream, okay? But when we do this kind of sleep lab work and we really systematically study dream content, what we discover is that during dreams, particularly REM dreams and N1 dreams, when that brain activity is like what we see when we're awake, we get some really fun characteristics to the dream content. And the research suggests that between 70 and 80% of the time while you're in a REM dream, you are getting some bizarre, odd content to that dream. So our brain is necessarily far more flexible during the REM state with regard to sort of creating either cognitive bizarre or hyper-emotional or just weird experiences that are part of the dream. It's not necessarily the dominant component, but there is something weird about most of our dreams, okay? But here, the last point is the one that Dolly was most concerned about and that I'm going to focus on today. And that is that in typical dreaming, one of the kind of hallmark characteristics is we have deficient memory for, we do not create what we call episodic memories for our dream experiences. We just don't. And that's probably a really smart thing because there's a lot of stuff happening during that dream that is, in fact, surreal. And it doesn't help us in our day-to-day -day experience most of the time. 
okay? And in fact, could create um, enhanced emotions and oftentimes some of them negative and so forth. So there could be negative repercussions if we remembered all of our dreams. So Dali wanted to overcome this and he used a technique that you're probably aware of that he called slumber with a key. And what he would do um, is that he would begin to take a nap and he would sit down in a comfortable chair and he would hold a very heavy metal key in one hand. And then he would allow himself to relax and fall asleep. And as he falls asleep, and again, I told you muscle is one of the things we measure, you get a decrease in muscle tone across the body. So your body naturally relaxes and lets go of the muscle tension in your body and you would drop the key. And what he recommended doing is having a plate, I don't know how many plates he had because this could get expensive, but the point is that he would have a plate sitting under the key and it would drop and break the plate and that loud noise would wake him up. And then he would quickly sort of extract as much of the imagery and the ideas and the feelings that he could from that sort of dream content that he was just experiencing and he would utilize that as a source for his artistry, okay? So this technique, what, area, what type of, of uh, brain activity should be happening during N1, which is what first happens? It looks a lot like wakefulness. So we know that those N1 dreams absolutely would be an amazing source of inspiration and imagery and ideas because it has that kind of um, sort of surrealistic and um, fantastic characteristic to the dreams that we have during that in one phase. Okay? One of the things people miss, uh, and I should have said this earlier, misunderstand about dreaming is they think they only dr dream in REM. You don't. You dream throughout the night. Okay? It's just the nature of those dreams differ. I should have said that earlier. So that's in one. Okay? So Dali made it, you know, developed this technique, utilized it, taught it to other artists. This was sort of one of his phenomenal tools for sort of inspiring the, the kind of surrealistic art he's, he's was such a master of. Um, but I want to move to a different phase of sleep. And, and I've looked, and, and try, I'm, you know, this is not my area of expertise. I'm definitely not an art historian. I'm just a neuroscientist. Um, but um, what, from what I can see, Dali was aware of lucid dreaming, but I, don't, I haven't read, so correct me if I'm wrong, him talking extensively about utilizing um, REM sleep dreams as a tool for producing greater art. But... I'm hoping to share with you, so that you might use this in your day-to-day -day life, um, the idea that we could actually also tap those much longer, more um, narrative-driven, and in many ways, most more interesting part of our dream experience, and that those are the dreams that we experience during REM sleep. And the way we can do this is using a technique we call lucid dreaming. Now, lucid dreaming has been around as a topic for a very, very long time. In fact, even going back to writings of Aristotle, there's lots of interesting um, examples of this construct of lucid dreaming being discussed really throughout our history of sort of, bio, um, sort of f philosophy and psychology. But starting in the about nine, early 1900s, we get a conversation around sort of these, this utilization of the term lucid dreams, and we get sort of our first real kind of operational definition from the science side, sort of way of defining this term and this experience, okay? And so um, as this was discussed, it's really kind of got a couple different characteristics. One issue is that we reach a state of awareness. So we become aware during the actual dream that we are dreaming. That's one characteristic. Another thing that is important is that we become, at least to some degree, able to control our dreams. So we act more volitionally with intent 
in our dream context, okay? Now, another thing that wasn't talked about originally, but is also kind of one of the hallmark um, definition, parts of the definition of lucid dreaming is that we oftentimes have greater access to our own personal memories. So we can bring that information to bear as we're engaging in this lucid dream. So what this is, is literally a situation where you're still asleep physiologically, phenomenologically, you are still in a REM dream, but you have some degree of conscious awareness that you are dreaming, that who, you know who you are, where you are, and for the lucky folks, um, they have some degree of control over what's going to happen in the dream. Okay, so they could choose to fly, all right? This is my husband, the other doctor, actually talks about the fact that he sort of can make himself fly in his dreams, right? So I, I'm not good like that, but <laughs> he's able to do that. So there are ways in which you could sort of change how, what's happening in this experience. And you stay asleep. That's a key characteristic of lucid dreaming. Now, there has been, um, with the development of cognitive neuroscience methods like functional magnetic resonance imaging, using tools like I use, which is electroencephalography, but also behavioral studies, prospective kinds of studies, teaching people to lucid dream. So there's a range of research that's been done in this area. Most of it actually is out of, um, interestingly enough, Germany and Austria. So the Max Planck in Munich is one of the hubs of a lot of the work around lucid dreaming. Um, there has been research utilizing a number of different techniques, some of them literally having people fall asleep and having a lucid dream while inside an fMRI scanner, if you can imagine. I've spent hours in the things. It, I can't imagine falling asleep in there, but some people can. And we can actually look at what's happening with the brain activity and brain co connect connectivity, as well as what areas of the brain are most active during lucid lucid dreaming. And so we can actually literally directly contrast lucid dreaming in REM to non-lucid dreaming in REM or to wakefulness. And here's an example. And what you see is that really in so many ways, the lucid dream looks very much like a person who's awake and imagining something. And we see many of the same brain regions lighting up across the head, and I'll show you that in a second. But here's the key difference. If you look at the EMG line, so that's the second line there, notice you have full most muscle tone. That looks like a healthy body to me. Um, but then I'm a neuroscientist, so I know what I'm looking for. But that's normal EMG activity, muscle tone activity. Your muscles create electricity as well, and so we can measure them. And you can see that that line is almost flat in the person experiencing lucid dreaming. So that person is truly asleep. It's very difficult to pretend to be asleep as far as what's happening in your muscles. You really can't do that. And another thing that's kind of intriguing is you get a little bit of a difference in the EOG channels in that you get some different kinds of scans. If you notice, there's like dunk, 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 dunk on those. That is the rapid eye movement that gives REM its name. Okay, so you do these scans, and pa scan patterns are very typical. So this is, we have electrophysiological data that suggests that REM sleep, or REM lucid dreaming is much like um, wakefulness, and particularly wakefulness when we're engaging in ma imagination. If we look across the brain, we see a number of different brain regions that are activated specifically during lucid dreaming in a way that is stronger than what happens in non-lucid dreaming. In particular, two areas that I really love very, very much. Um, one is, if you look over there, the area called the pre pre precuneus. Blah, blah, blah. Precuneus is an area of the parietal lobe, the posterior parietal lobe, that's really important for things like self-awareness. So if a patient, for example, has damage to that area, they have a symptom we call onosognosia and um, they, are, they lose self-awareness, so we can get all kinds of changes in body image representations and all kinds of other interesting things. Um, so we get change there. We also get lots of changes in this area we, that with the acronym PFC. PFC stands for prefrontal cortex. It's like my favorite part of the brain. And 
it is um, an area that's really important for lots of higher order cognitive processes, things we call executive functioning, and also for things like creativity. Okay, so um, we men it was mentioned that I do work on how spending time in nature is good for you cognitively and emotionally. That is the area that we think is most affected by exposure to nature, is the prefrontal cortex. And it's really important for things like self-consciousness and emotion, but it's also important for things like problem solving and being creative and looking for new solutions. Also important for selective attention and working memory, these kinds of online skills. Okay, and by the way, just as an aside, spending time in nature actually improves processing in all of those areas. So get outside if you're not sleeping. All right. So, or go see art. Art's good too. Um, so how can we lucid dream? Is this something we can learn to do? Yes, it is. There's actually a number of different techniques that have been pretty extensively studied um, in the empirical sciences that help us increase our likelihood of being able to have this amazing experience of lucid dreaming. And by the way, it, this is not uncommon. Um, in some very large meta-analyses of very broad data, it's believed that at least 50% of us have had at least one lucid dreaming experience in our life. So where we've been asleep and then we kind of got aware that we were dreaming and then sort of went with that for a little period of time. Most people have had, or at least half of us have had that experience at least once. And about 20 to 25% of us actually have this happen um, at least every couple months. And there are some people, particularly those who spend a lot of time sort of working at it, who can lucid dream even almost every night. Some people can even have multiple lucid dreams in a single evening, okay? So lucid dreaming is possible. And one of my favorite techniques is this one called a mild mnemonic induction of lucid dreaming. And I'm going to introduce that to you today to give you guys a take home that maybe you can use in your everyday life. It's just sort of fun. Be a little experimenter, a little scientist with your own sleep. So how do you do this? Well, number one, improve sleep quality. Go back to that sleep hygiene slide. Get your sleep better. If you're not sleeping, you're not dreaming. So you got to be asleep to dream. Another really important thing is to get into a regular habit of keeping a sleep journal, okay? So if you get in the habit, and I've done this myself, I do this every single year, so I know it's true. Um, when I'm teaching my sleep and dreaming class, I ask my students to keep a sleep a dream journal, so I start doing it. You're gonna have a workshop on it here, so take advantage. If you practice keeping a sleep journal, you actually will increase your ability to recall dreams. If that becomes a sort of cognitive effortful task that you engage in, you're actually going to get better at remembering your dreams, even those folks who don't remember your dreams now. And then another thing that you engage in is something called reality testing. Reality testing seems a little wonky, a little out there, but it's actually a, a, a sort of cognitive process that we've been studying a fair bit um, because it's really important for sort of self-awareness and actually activates those precuneous areas in the parietal lobe as well as prefrontal cortex areas. And what the, my favorite um, version of reality testing is to just periodically go like this. We can all do that. And the idea is that when you do this and your finger touches your hand, you say, oh, I'm awake, and I'm here, and I'm normal, right? And if you just sort of get in the habit of doing this multiple times over the course of a day, what can happen, what happens with people who are teaching themselves to lucid dream is they do this while they're asleep, and their finger goes through their hand. And it can actually trigger the cognition, oh my gosh, I must be asleep. So it sounds weird, I grant you, it sounds hokey as all get out, but truthfully, reality testing is one of the critical keys to engaging in this kind of technique for, for in learning to lucid dream. So practice dream recall, um, engage in this kind of reality testing. Another thing you can do, and, and again, um, issues of meditation, mindfulness, 
20 years ago, I would have been drummed out of the core for talking about those kinds of things. There's a lot of really interesting empirical research, really well done science around the fact that meditation is um, really beneficial. Some of it, uh, my own, um, I know from my own research that we can decrease anger and it doesn't take much. Simple meditation training can really have a big impact on both the cognitive as well as the physiological characteristics of anger. It's published in, in Consciousness and Cognition. So the bottom line is that we know that if you can engage in some kind of meditative practice where you're reaffirming in your mind, sort of mantra, if you will, next time I dream, I will remember I'm dreaming, or um, I will have a lucid dream tonight. If you engage in that sort of meditative process, okay, and another real key that can be super helpful in this, in this practice is to visualize a recent dream. Now here's something that's kind of intriguing. This idea of visualizing a recent dream and then sort of walking through it as a kind of storyboard or a narrative in your own head. Many people sort of think that could be traumatic, right? But that actually is one of our most effective interventions for people with things like PTSD. But the trick is not to dwell on the content as it currently stands. What you want to try to do is visualize it as if you were in that dream scenario, but you're able to change the outcome of the dream. Right? So you're practicing if you have... So the reason I learned to lucid dream, I'll admit, I learned to lucid dream back when I was in grad school and I learned about this because I was having a reoccurring nightmare. Okay, and I was having a reoccurring nightmare about a young woman in my high school who had bullied me as a kid and I would have these terrible dreams and I would wake up feeling very sad and crying and angry or just belittled and it was awful and I just had these reoccurring dreams. I think it was my way of my imposter syndrome coming out because we all have that. Anyways, but I was having these nightmares and so I taught myself to lucid dream and one of the things I did was what would I do if I were in a dream, my reoccurring dream where she's being mean to me, what could I do? And I would practice that in my head. And we do the same thing. Um, one of my areas that I'm, I'm very passionate about is working with our veterans. Um, my husband is a former army officer, so I was an army wife for a while. And um, in working with folks who are going through traumatic dreams based on their time in active service is a big part of this. And we can use these kinds of techniques of sort of visualizing the content, even though it's traumatic, and rethinking it in a, with a new outcome can be very therapeutic, even just that kind of meditative practice, that kind of a cognitive ta um, engagement with the material, okay? And sometimes you're doing this in bed, you're laying there, you're sort of doing your mantra, then you're thinking about your dreams, and maybe you go back to your mantra a little bit, and you're probably gonna fall asleep. Yay, that's exactly what we want to have happen, okay? So you gauge in this, and that can lead to, with practice, an increased likelihood of engaging in lucid dreaming. So give it a try. There's nothing, no cost, right? Super easy. Let's practice that. So what can this do for you? Well, I'm going to start by talking about what we know lucid dreaming seems to do for artists, going back to the sort of whole point of shape of dreams. <laughs> so there is empirical research that those who are capable or engage in lucid dreaming um, have a greater measure of creativity and a number of different ways of measuring creativity. We know that people are better at, who engage in lucid dreaming as a regular practice, tend to be better at um, problem solving. And there is even some re very recent research suggesting that we can prospectively pick a random sample of individuals teach them to lucid dream and see a change in their problem solving ability, particularly around things like the uh, um, Iowa gambling task, which is a commonly used decision making task. Um, we definitely get a greater re retention, not just of the dream narrative, but also the imagery, again, making that fodder for artistry that we may be engaged in. We find that people who lucid dream actually talk about engaging in experimentation in that sort of free-for-all world where anything can happen. What would happen if I tried to do X? And, and sort of practicing some of their artistry and trying things. And one of my favorites, kind of part because I do work on depression, is that um, one of the really interesting studies, and this is a direct quote from one of the research participants, people have learned to sort of ignore criticism 
and utilize the lucid dreaming. Because again, going back, think back to my sort of nasty friend, what do you call those, frenemy in high school, right? Um, she was my inner critic, in effect. And it, I feel like that is exactly what I did, is I overcame that sort of sense of um, sort of insufficiency and, and, and being not good enough. So those are some of the things that, again, through empirical measures, we've been able to see evidence of that for artistry. For the rest of us, there's, um, oops, I went the wrong way. I do that sometimes, <laughs> even though I've taught for 30 plus years. Um, the um, another benefit we use this as I mentioned as a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we've used this as a treatment or intervention around things like phobias. Um, people often who experience extreme phobia dream about the thing they're phobic of. Engaging in lucid dreaming can give them a sort of sense of control over those experiences with the thing that they're phobic with. Um, we've looked at it in changing mood and depression. Okay, so again, depression, perseverative thoughts, perseverative negative biases, we can help address some of those. And there are a number of sleep disorders that we also, and dreaming related disorders that we use this as a treatment for. But for non-clinical applications, my favorite, there is some work on, on sort of improving um, athletic performance and skill learning. So there is some stuff, not surprising, we have these cool neurons in our primary motor area called mirror neurons that if they work, they actually can acquire new skills. But my favorite, given my interest in prefrontal cortex, is that um, people who engage in lucid dreaming have better metacognitive processes. What's metacognition? Part of that is self-awareness, which is something we all could like benefit with a little bit more of. But it's also sort of other kinds of cognitions that are sort of awareness of our own cognitive abilities. So I know I have metacognitive awareness that I'm lousy at remembering names, so I practice it. That kind of metacognitive awareness and developing metacognitive skills, we can actually see evidence that folks who are engaged in lucid dreaming have stronger, stronger skills in those kinds of executive function areas, involving, again, those same structures, the precuneus, the prefrontal cortex region. So, Lots of benefit that one could have from engaging in lucid dreaming. And that's the end of my talk. So I'm going to go back to the first one because it's my favorite piece of art. <laughs> Here we go. Because I don't know why, but I love this one. So let me stop there and, I, and see if there's any questions. Yes, sir, please. Yes, uh, great. You wouldn't be wrong. No, you wouldn't be wrong. Um, in fact, and, and one of the things I, I just didn't spend time on, because I think actually um, um, Dr. Hines does a nice job of discussing this in um, the publication of, that supports this exhibit, um, the catalog. But in addition, I was, um, you know, I didn't want to take this into a clinical domain because I, I I'm a brain girl, but um, I have done a lot of clinical training in my time, and I worked as a, I trained PhDs in clinical psychology, and many of the um, most common um, psychotherapies that we use, whether it's psychodynamics or cognitive behavioral therapies or humanistic approaches to therapy, um, sort of take into account the fact that there is this high emotional content in dreams. We know that people who are experiencing depression or some kind of stressful life event like divorce have a reoccurrence of some of those either explicit experiences that, they're, that sort of are part of that negative affective um, moment in their, in their lives or are sort of referential to the emotions that they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are a number of theories that argue that going through the dreaming process may help us, may actually serve a benefit to sort of, if you will, healing some of those emotional traumas. And in a way, and some of the most intriguing work is that we may naturally do something like what I'm talking about doing with lucid dreaming. In other words, maybe, and there's, again, 
dream report research is hard to do in a way that's sort of as scientifically sound as we would all like, but there is certainly um, clinical observations that have been made around the fact that people who dream about something that was causing them a lot of angst and anxiety and sadness, if the, if the outcome of that dream is positive, then those, those negative emotions have less impact on their day-to-day -day experience. And in fact, um, one of the amazing um, undergraduate research assistants that I have a chance to work with has been looking at exactly that issue. Um, her name is Cassandra Robinson, right? So again, bad with names, but um, Cassandra is actually working, doing a research project with nurses and looking at um, affective valence and with nurses and obviously going through COVID and all the rest has been a really hard time for uh, our medical um, healthcare providers. And so um, she's looked at sort of how mood is directly impacted by the valence of the dreams that you had the night before and sort of looking at that. Does the mood cause the dream or does the dream cause the mood? Tough to tease apart, but it seems definitely the, the dream causes mood is, seems to be supported empirically and um, sort of looking at sort of ways people sort of handle those dreams and then also what happens during the dream seems to be important as well. So you would not be wrong. You would be absolutely correct. And that was a very long-winded way of saying, you are right. <laughs> yes. How do like ambient effects? Oh, boy. All right. So I have my colleague in the room who's the specialist in drugs and behavior. Hey, Adriana, back there. <laughs> um, I, I tend to stay out of the world of drugs and behavior because I have enough stuff on my plate, and so I don't act as if I'm an expert in all of this sort of stuff. There are a lot of psychopharmacological interventions for poor sleep. Um, some of them I, I, I have no trouble endorsing. I love the idea of a very low dose of melatonin taken at the proper time, yay for that. Things like Ambien, there's a number of other sort of pharmacological interventions that have both positive and negative impact on sleep. And so, um, you know, my general takeaway is messing with neurochemistry is gonna lead to both good and bad. <laughs> and so, um, what I worry about with some of those um, is that they create a kind of disinhibition. It shuts down some of those um, muscular sort of control mechanisms that keep us from acting out on our dreams. And so um, I worry about sort of how that can lead to things like um, REM eating disorders, REM behavioral disorders, other kinds of things. So. I don't think I answered your question, but mostly because I was saying I don't want to. <laughs> yes, back here, and then I'll come up front. For those who have a traumatic brain injury, mm. do you see uh, these sleep techniques and brain techniques to help heal their brain? Ooh. You know, okay, so the real answer, I don't know. Um, but, you know, making a reasonable, educated guess, I mean, what, what we have oftentimes with TBI is traumatic brain injury is um, sort of, um, it really depends on where, how, what happened, la, la, la. So there's a lot of variability in studying TBI. But one of the problems that you do run into in most TBI patients, given the nature of how the brain moves inside of the skull. So you can kind of think of your brain as a giant sort of um, bone cage, and your brain is this floppy little thing inside, and we have a lot of protective tissue that kind of keeps that surface of the brain from being injured. But if you really smack your head hard, boom, 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 your brain tends to move around inside the head, and we tend to have what we call coup and counter coup damage that happens. So the original point of contact, you're gonna have some trauma to brain there, but we oftentimes, unfortunately, 
affect anterior prefrontal cortex, which is one of the key areas that we're talking about here. So across TBI patients, prefrontal area and prefrontal damage tends to be one of the more commonly sort of disrupted sort of areas. Another problem is that the brain is a big squishy blub, right? And so as it's moving, it tends to twist. And when that happens, the long sort of connective fibers that go between brain regions have a tendency to be also damaged. So we can have a disruption in brain connectivity. So um, we, we believe that we can, to some degree, with various kinds of interventions, actually promote improvement in processing in prefrontal cortex and intracranial connectivity that might support a range of different kinds of complex cognitions. Um, I have the honor of working for example, with a colleague in the Department of Music, Dr. Jennifer Bugis. And we are working on creating um, uh, jazz improvisation and humor improvisation classes to help promote greater cognitive flexibility in older adults. And um, those are the kinds of things that I think are important kinds of practices, because we've known for a long time that Older brains are, no, are still plastic and flexible and able to learn, so that older dog do, can't learn new tricks is a bunch of hooey. We can, we do. Um, so to get back to your question, to the degree that that large network of structures are sort of activated and we see an increase in activation across those brain regions, right, during a uh, lucid dreaming experience, it would be really reasonable, I think, to hypothesize that engaging in lucid dreaming could, in fact, be an intervention that could have some use. But I don't have any empirical data to speak to that. I'm just saying I, I, I could motivate a grant <laughs> to ask for money to study this, because I do think there's enough work that would argue that that's a really reasonable and interesting hypothesis. There was a question down here and then back here. Uh, yeah, uh, having just uh, uh, had 80 and I think there's a lot of that around the people behind me. Um, I wonder, that I, I, are you uh, aware of the old uh, thing from the 1500s, 1600s, the first sleep, second sleep? Yes, I love that stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. And the idea of having a bimodal sleep and that actually during that intermittent phase, we developed all kinds of social cognitions. We were in this tight sort of community. I love that stuff. Well, yeah. They, they, yeah. People back in the 1600s would wake up at 1 o'clock yep. and prepare a meal. Yep. Yeah, you know, so, and this was pretty normal. This was before light. Yep. It seems to me that the clients, my clients, that I talk with that are older, mm -hmm. uh, that happens, and they somehow or another buy into this idea that you have to sleep eight yeah. hours yeah. Yeah. straight, yeah. which I, I think is wrong, and actually as you get older, I think you'll wake up. Yep, you have more phasic sleep, yep. Yeah, and that's normal. I, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree at all, and in fact, um, you know, I, a big part, a chunk of time I spend with my undergrads talking about the value of napping. And if you can nap properly, naps can be really good for your brain. So I don't disagree with you one bit. And in fact, um, you know, my own father has sleep issues. He has Parkinson's disease, has for 17 years. Um, he's still doing pretty darn good. Um, but one of the big things I work on is his sleep. But, it, but I also tell him, you know, don't fight it at one in the morning. Just continue, you know, don't turn on TV, which he wouldn't do anyway. Don't engage in stuff that's going to kind of trick your body into thinking the sun's coming up. But I think there's um, that, that that is a kind of a restful, wakeful period has, has value. I, I think part of what we've lost here's me really going on a limb, but I think that the, that period of time was really important for developing empathy and social cognitions and theory of mind and all of the sort of social cognitive neuroscience-y stuff that's really important that we're kind of losing in our disconnected world today. 
And so I think it's not only kind of beneficial in the sense that if you st become stressed out about the nature of your sleep, you're going to sleep less well. So I think it's sort of a matter of just sort of saying, it's cool, this is how I sleep, and I'm still getting my time. I just do it in a different way than tip what I did at 50 or 30. But the other side of it is I think that that time could be used beneficially. Yes. And so I'm not against that, that, that approach one iota. I tend to use the, uh, the uh, roof that doesn't have the, mm -hmm. the proper light. You know. Yep, yep, no, it's good. And, and, and um, yeah, I mean, I think, that, again, um, getting up and making a meal may not be the thing I would do. <laughs> but beyond that, I'm willing to endorse the whole idea, yes. There was a question here and then there and then there. I'll kind of do it like that, that, yeah. Nothing's quick with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's called the Iowa Gambling Task. Yes, it's, it's, it's just a measure that we've used so many times that we have some ideas to how that affects both cognition and the brain. So Iowa Gambling Task. Dream sleep, or excuse me, lucid dreaming does not help um, other kinds of things like Wisconsin card sort, for those of you in the, in the field. So there's some things that helps and some kinds of problem solving it doesn't help. It's preferential, which is actually good. We don't want it to help everything. We want it to help just specific things. There was a question right in there someplace. Yes? When you get a concept of neurodivergent versus yep. typical thinking and the different you know, dichotomies of that impact how we sleep and how we feel. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, one of the, there's not as much work looking at neurodivergence and say, for example, autism spectrum disorder, which is one of the common ones that come up. There is some work in that area, but don't know it super well. What I've actually spent more time in, because the, the research area is just older, is looking at um, how, um, what dreams look like in individuals who are blind, which is not exactly what you're talking about, but it is certainly a sensory divergence, if you will. And um, so it's absolutely the case that your sort of day-to-day, -day, both sensory motor experience, but also your affective experience and so forth is going to influence the nature of your dreams, for sure. Your dream content is, to a large degree, a reflection of your day-to-day -day experience. It's just a, it's just a more fantastical version <laughs> in many ways. So, um, so yeah, we, we certainly, um, we, so one question, for example, I, I work with individuals who are deaf and look at ASL in my psycholinguistic side of myself. And, um, and so there's been a little work, you know, talking about, you know, what is a dream of experience of a person who is, um, been deaf since birth or, or uh, you know, had acquired deafness because of some kind of trauma, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of work. So yeah, I think it's a, a fruitful area. And yes, you would expect and you will see that there is a difference um, in the nature of the dreams. Absolutely. Yeah. To me, it uh, seemed very magical. Mm. You know, uh, I look at a painting like what's in front of us here. It's like uh, David Copperfield doing like a magic trick. And Love I, it. I, I almost feel like the artist, uh, Dolly, he is taking like a, a very conservative person like myself looks at that and it changes my state subconsciously and opens myself up to a whole new reality. So you could have an audience that might have been very conservative mm -hmm. and some of them might say, oh, that's crap. Yeah. But then some of them subconsciously are thinking, wow. That's changing the way I'm, a new perspective of the way that I can look at life. Like, yeah. I'm not even thinking about that. And that could change a whole society on a class, on a consciousness level. Yep. So not only being an art, it could be a political statement, too. Mm -hmm. Changing from conservative to a more liberalist or open-minded person that thinks from a different perspective, that we can think different ways. We don't have to stand at a, at a staunch, one-sided perspective. I agree. I agree. And and I and I and so so part of I think one of my take home messages of today is that these fantastical worlds 
appear to you every night. If, if you know, kind of, you're sort of talking about taking on somebody else's magical experience. But, but what I find so exciting about the thought of engaging in lucid dreaming, or even if it's not lucid dreaming, even if it's just increasing your own recollection of your own dream content, and sort of having some way of kind of increasing your own um, openness, but also kind of retention of those amazing kinds of imagery that can come to us only during sleep could, could be beneficial in so many ways. I, I, in other words, I think, you know, Dolly's dream mind is in all of us. It may not be that you will have Dolly-like dreams when, if you have access to your own dream imagery, but it could be every bit as amazing and exciting or disturbing or provocative or, again, mind-opening as, as what Dolly was able to experience with his use of N1 dreams. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this sort of gives you a sense that you've all got a little Dali inside of all of you in the sense that your dreams are also fantastic and magical and amazing. And wouldn't it be cool if you knew something more about what was happening in your brain while you slept? I agree.